All right, folks, we're just given a few moments here at the top for Zoom to let everybody in before we get started. If you are already in tonight's event with us, uh, you can open up your chat window and find some information about how to purchase books by tonight's featured authors. Good evening and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Chelsea from Greenlight and we're thrilled to host tonight's event with Maria Konnikova presenting the paperback edition of her book, The Biggest Bluff, How I Learned to Pay Attention, Master Myself and Win. She'll be talking with Nate Silver, so you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just wanna say a huge thanks to Maria, Nate, and the team at Penguin Books for making this happen, and to all of you for showing up. Though we're not able to host events in our store spaces, our community of authors and readers is still here. We're grateful for your support and give a chance to make the space for conversation and connection. Now, just a few housekeeping things. First, in our Zoom web webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they cannot see or hear you. They can see that you're here though, and you can see a count of your fellow attendees at the top of your Zoom screen. There are a couple different ways you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event, which we highly encourage. The first is the chat, which you can find by clicking on the icon that looks like one speech balloon. You're welcome to post your comments and thoughts in the chat. That's a great way to show your appreciation for the author and interact with fellow attendees. If you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by the author, please post that question in the Q&A module. You can find it by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. We'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered in the later part of the program. And importantly, tonight's featured book, The Biggest Bluff, is available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person in our bookstore locations, noon to 7 p.m. every day of the week, and you can purchase Maria's book and many others on site. Or order online at greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the U.S. I'll drop that by link in the chat. If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. Our interviewer tonight is Nate Silver. He is the founder and editor in chief of 538 and the author of The Signal and the Noise, why so many predictions fail, but some don't. He'll be speaking with our featured author, Maria Konnikova. She's the author of Mastermind and The Confidence Game. She's a regular contributing writer for The New Yorker and has written for many other publications. Her writing has won numerous awards, including the 2019 Excellence in Science Journalism Award. While researching The Biggest Bluff, Maria became an international poker champion and the winner of over 300,000 in tournament earnings. Maria also hosts the podcast Griff from Panoply Media and is currently a visiting fellow at NYU School of Journalism. Her podcasting work earned her a National Magazine Award nomination in 2019. Maria graduated from Harvard University and received her PhD in psychology from Columbia University. Her book, The Biggest Bluff, follows Maria down the rabbit hole with Eric Seidel, Poker Hall of Fame inductee and winner of tens of millions of dollars in earnings into the wild, fiercely competitive, overwhelmingly masculine world of high stakes Texas Hold'em. Maria is going to be talking with Nate and then she'll be answering questions from all of you. Maria and Nate, please take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Um, I am in New York. Um, Maria, do you wanna tell people where, where you are? 
course, it's only fitting that I be doing this interview from Las Vegas as we launch the biggest bluff paperback into the world. And before I let you continue, Nate, thank you so much for being here and for doing this. And thank you, Chelsea and Green Light Books for hosting us. Support your local bookstores. Um, and buy the book. I mean, I probably, I think if you're on this panel, you probably have, have bought the book already, but buy a second copy. Um, <laughs> give it to a friend. Um, but anyway, so um, Maria, what's it like being in Vegas in the middle of a pandemic? I have a Vegas trip coming up soon, but I want to know what, what should I expect? It's surreal. So I just got here a few days ago. And coming from New York, um, it is quite a contrast. Um, I think it's fair to say that the pandemic no longer exists um, in, in Las Vegas. Um, I don't see any masks. I don't see any distancing. The casinos are now at full capacity starting June 1st. The shows are finally starting to come back. Um, and the mask mandates have been dropped completely for everyone who's vaccinated. Um, and I think some unvaccinated people are sneaking by as well. The honor code does not work the way we think it's going to work. <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine that Vegas is the kind of place where they're necessarily going strictly by the definition of the rules anyway. But um, uh, but can you talk a little bit about what you're doing in Vegas? And you probably have to be careful about this new project of yours. Yeah, absolutely. So um, of course I'm gonna play some poker. I would not I would not be in Vegas without that, but I'm actually here um, working on my next project, which is also Vegas related. Um, stay tuned. I'll be telling people a lot more about it um, in the coming months, but it's going to be for Audible. So for everyone who enjoyed listening to The Biggest Bluff rather than reading it, um, this one's for you. And there will be a written component as well, but it will be audio first, um, which, is something that I've been experimenting with more lately. I think it's such an exciting new format to be able to do things with audio components and include the voices of the people that you're interviewing as a journalist, um, not just your own voice. Well, I know some top secret stuff about this project. I'm very excited about it. So I'm looking forward <laughs> to you being able to reveal more information soon. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about like, these are kind of selfish questions because I like talking about as an author about the book writing process and kind of what it's like. And I hope that for people, it's sort of interesting about how kind of how an author goes through, um, goes through the process of actually kind of conceiving of and writing a book. Um, but so how did you get the idea for The Biggest Bluff originally? Was it like an outgrowth of the confidence game or did you meet some poker players? It was just total on the whim, you know, what happened? Yeah, um, so the, the origin story um, that I describe in the book is actually quite similar to, to what happened in reality, um, which is that I wanted to write about luck and the role that chance plays in our lives. Um, and it's because I went through, you know, a period of bad luck in my life when, you know, I got sick, my grandmother died, a bunch of people in my family lost their jobs. You know, a lot of things happened that made me just stop and reflect on how important it is to be lucky. And it's not like I had never thought about this before, right? It's something that I thought about many, many times, um, starting from you know early childhood, because I came here as a four-year-old um, and my parents left the Soviet Union and that was completely luck for me, right? That was not my decision. I had nothing to do with it. And yet it completely changed my life. But you know, when I tell my agent, hey, I wanna write about luck, um, she smiles and nods and says, okay, <laughs> what's the book? <laughs> right? That's, that is not a book. And so we, I, I think I spent about a year back and forth with different ideas and different proposals. Oh, wow. okay. yeah. yeah, just being like, oh, you know, why don't I write about immigrants who grow up in the same apartment building and have very different lives or people who came in on the same ship on Ellis Island on the same day and will follow their trajectory. Or, you know, I, I, I was going down all of these different directions. Um, daily Even fantasy sports. Free ideas. Yeah, lots of ideas, guys. Grab them, <laughs> grab them here. Um, but none of them, none of them were quite right. And so I kept reading and I kept pushing um, and I came close to telling my agent that she was fired, not really, she's wonderful. But you know, I, I was getting very frustrated that, that this just wasn't working. And then I started reading about game theory as kind of a framework for, for looking at chance and learned that John von Neumann, the father of game theory was a poker player. And that's actually what 
brought me to start reading about poker because of the way that von Neumann wrote about it. Because von Neumann is, he, sure, he's a polymath, but just brilliant mind, genius, but he's a mathematician. I mean, that's his background. His background is hardcore numbers. And he was writing about the fact that to him, poker was interesting because it wasn't just the numbers, it was also the human element. Um, it was also bluffing and interactions and trying to read dynamics and all of this stuff. And he said, that's life, that's strategic decision-making, that's real decision-making. Real decision-making can't just be math. Sure, math is a big part of it, but there's also all this other stuff. Now, how do I put math on it, right? He wanted to solve it at the end. Yeah. He, did, he did want to find this, this model for solving it. And I became really intrigued by the way he wrote about it and thought, what is this poker thing? Literally, I mean, I had never, I'm not someone who'd watched poker growing up or who'd played poker growing up or who had really any interest in poker. To me, poker is Teddy KGB, you know, sitting at, yeah, the, yeah. at the poker table, you know, paid the man his money. <laughs> that, that's poker in my book <laughs> prior to this. And so that's how I got into it something just clicked when I started reading about it. I was like, whoa, why don't I learn this game? Why don't I actually immerse myself in it and have that journey be the story of chance, be the story of kind of starting to parse the controllable from the not and trying to kind of trying to answer those questions. Yeah, I don't know if it's true of all games. I mean, there's something about poker where it's a very immersive kind of game right you learn more about it and then the more you learn about it the more you're like oh I still kind of suck and I have to learn more still right and like you kind of get caught in the world and you tend to have a common vocabulary with other players I mean tell me about like um what things about poker are different than that you refer to the movie rounders <laughs> earlier which is a wonderful depiction and was responsible for like some growth in poker back in the late 1990s um but as dramatized right what what did you learn about poker that was different than what you expected and then what do you think it might be the same answer it might not what do you think the average audience member might misconceive about about poker yeah um that's that's a really good question and you know i went in with very with no expectations you know i did not meet teddy kgb unfortunately <laughs> you know i i still hope to uh to run into john malkovich at the poker tables one of these days um but i i really came in I think with this Hollywood version of poker in my head, that it was these underground clubs and dark rooms and, you know, mob and cigar smoke and all of this stuff. And to be fair, some of that exists. But what really shocked me was just the number of absolutely brilliant, incredible people that I met in the game. You know, you have people who could basically do anything they want to with their lives, who some of them, you know, have PhDs from Stanford and Caltech and, you know, some of the best schools in the world, and they choose to play this game for a living. And it makes you just both reconsider the complexity of the game. I mean, the longer I play, the worse I get. This is definitely the feeling that I have. And the more I say, wow, I really don't understand this game and I have so much to learn and I just don't know when I will ever fully grasp it. So I think you're absolutely right in the immersive thing. But then you, you think, what is it about this game that attracts all of these brilliant minds? There's something here that, you know, instead of being in academia or, you know, doing this or doing that, they choose to play poker. I know, you know, we have a mutual friend, Brandon Adams, who taught at Harvard, right? Yeah. <laughs> right, Harvard? Harvard. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Harvard, um, maybe even MIT as well, I don't remember. But brilliant guy, plays poker. <laughs> and, and it really does draw people in. And that is not at all something that I expected. And I don't think that's what a lot of people expect when they think about poker when they think about what what this is I mean certainly you know I still have to uh my my grandmother was aghast to hear that I'm now back in <laughs> Vegas um for people who've read the biggest bluff my grandmother was not a fan of this project from from day one she thought I was selling my soul to the devil and <laughs> becoming a gambler and when she heard that I was going back to Vegas now for another project she just she was not a fan but she loves me <laughs> I mean, there is this whole history of like, I mean, the history of poker is laden with 
cheating and hustling, right? And it's kind of only relatively recently that um, your biggest concern was how to play more GTO game theory optimal or how to, you know, um, and not how to not get cheated, right? Um, but I don't know, what do you, I mean, uh, I mean, you talk in the book about like kind of your mental state. I'm gonna give you a statement and tell me whether you agree or disagree with it. All right. <laughs> the statement is that most of the time, live poker is quite boring. Um, and that's why it can be a challenge to, one of the reasons it can be a challenge to play well. Do you agree or disagree? Am I selling, I love playing poker, um, but am I selling poker short if I say that it's kind of boring? Okay, so, so I, I know what you're saying, but I disagree and here's why. So I think that there's a perception that live poker can be boring because if you're playing well, you're actually, you know, you shouldn't be playing that many hands. Um, there's a lot of time where you're just sitting there. But something that I learned from Eric Seidel, my mentor, was that the times when you're not in a hand are some of your most valuable opportunities to gather data to play better. So what you should be doing is when you're not in a hand, you should be observing every hand. You should be taking notes, mental notes. And I actually take physical notes as well, um, usually on my phone because I don't always have a notebook, but I have a notebook as well. Um, so sometimes by pen um, and try to actually figure out, you know, how are people playing? What are the dynamics that are developing? You know, who's being aggressive, who's not? How often are people doing this or that? How are they responding? You know, just taking all of that data in because so much of poker is data gathering, pattern recognition, understanding the dynamics and being able to take advantage of them. Because especially in live poker, and this isn't true of online poker, you can talk more to this because you started as an online poker player. Yeah. Um, but live poker, I think, is a lot more exploitative um, than online poker. Online poker is a lot more mathematical a lot of the time, but the live player pool, there is a lot more going on. There's a lot more kind of personal nuance that you can take advantage of, um, but only if you're paying attention. And it's so easy, and I struggle with this too. I mean, it's so easy to just drift away and get on your phone and start doing other things. Um, it's such a temptation that it, it's really important to just have actually keep reminding yourself that this is not boring, that it's actually engaging and that you're you're gathering, you are a detective at the poker table. Yeah, it's part of what I mean. It's like playing your C game where you're on your phone a lot, not really paying attention, right? Um, it takes a lot of energy to go from playing your C game to your B game or your A game. And attention is the word that I would associate with that first and foremost, right? Um, you won some tournaments, made deep runs. You know, I've never won a lot of tournaments. I've made a couple final tables. All of a sudden, you're not bored at a final table because the decisions are high stakes. And like, you're like, mm -hmm. okay, I can like, um, spend my time thinking about what happens if I pick up a big hand in this spot, how should I play given the other player stacks and so forth. But like, but that concentration is hard, right? <laughs> it can be pretty exhausting to, um, to play a full day of poker. For sure. I mean, I think that that's one of the things that I also found surprising that theoretically you're playing a game and yet it's the most mentally and physically intense experience I've ever had in my life, just bar none. Um, not while, you know, writing or, you know, maybe I had it for a few hours when I was defending my dissertation <laughs> in front of this committee of psych luminaries. Um, I had an open defense so everyone could come and I had, you know, everyone could see me if I, if I messed up or, <laughs> or did something wrong. Um, so, but that's a concentrated burst of adrenaline. In poker, if you're actually playing your A game, if you're doing your best, if you're really out there, you are constantly on. And at the end of the day, you are just drained. Your yeah. brain is drained, your body is drained. I've, you know, Eric had, had joked that I should have written a different book instead of the biggest bluff called The Poker Diet, because every time <laughs> I play, when I'm, you know, playing a long event, when I'm playing for a week of, you know, concentrated tournaments or whatever it is, no matter what, I lose weight. It's, and I'm not trying to lose weight. I don't, I, it's not intentional at all. It's just the actual 
the calories that you burn because you're so concentrated, because you're so, you're working so hard. And there was a really cool study that came out, I think it was last year about chess players that showed actually the, the metabolism rate going up and how many calories chess players are, are burning at the highest levels. And I think poker, when you're going through these marathon sessions, the same is true. And it's because your brain is working so hard and your body is working so hard. That's why one of my biggest tips for people who are actually going to be playing seriously or who are going to be doing tournaments that last multiple days is to really, really focus on a little bit of self-care. So I do yoga and meditation every single morning. And I don't actually think I'd be able to get through the days without it um, just because it's it's really hard. Oh, no, a lot, you know, Brandon's a good example, you know, into physical fitness and like, that's kind of a change we've seen as poker's gotten more competitive. There used to be a lot of <laughs> schlubby poker players. There still are some certainly, right? Um, but they're also young, fit men and women um, who think it's an important part of, of their play. Um, did you have like, I mean, in some ways the whole premise of the book, right? But were there particular like kind of aha moments that stood out for you? Like now I am actually pretty freaking good at this or is it more kind of gradual? Well, I had um, an aha moment that was the opposite where I really, there was a moment where I realized that I was completely exhibiting the Dunning-Kruger effect, which <laughs> basically means that, you know, the dumbest people and the people who are the worst at something are the least aware of their own incompetence. I remember this feeling during my first ever live event, which was a charity tournament, um, where I suddenly found myself with lots of chips because I got insanely lucky. Um, and you know, people were dropping out and here I was with a big pile of chips. And I was like, oh, this is not so bad. This is actually pretty easy. I get this yeah. poker thing. And then I had to catch myself and say, well, oh my God, you have no idea what you're doing. And obviously I, busted the tournament pretty soon after that. Um, but it was so funny realizing you know, how, when you don't know anything, you can be like, oh, you know, I finally realized, you know, whether a flush beats a straight or, you know, where a full house is and you can raise, yeah, great, I've got it all down. And then of course, as I say, the more you learn, the worse you get, the worse you realize um, that you get. But there were a few moments where, I felt like things just clicked um, where there had been things that I'd been struggling with um, and all of a sudden everything just clicked into place. And what I will say about those moments though is that they don't always last because you have to keep playing and you have to keep your mind in the game. And if you stop, I think this is true of everything, but with poker, it's just so noticeable. If you, if your head is not in the game, if you stop putting in the time, if you stop actually working hard, it's gonna catch up with you. And the things that clicked don't necessarily click for good. And you'll then have to kind of dust the rust off, uh, which is what I'm finding right now um, as, as I come back from a year and a half of not touching <laughs> any, any poker cards. Do you think it's um, easier for someone like you to become very skilled at poker now, or is it harder? You know, I think that's a question that's actually, that I'd love to hear your answer to because you've been around poker much longer than I have. And pe when people ask me and they say, wow, you're coming into poker at such a tough time, I don't have anything to compare it to. This is the only poker world that I know. You know, this is the world I got into and it's very competitive and I love that. You know, I like that it's tough. I like that there are players who constantly challenge me. You know, I used to, there was, I remember the first time I ever sat down at a table with real big deal pros. It was my, it was a big event. It was in Monte Carlo and, you know, they had been playing, you know, the hundred thousand dollar buy-in tournaments and here they were, you know, slumming it with me um, in the, in the 2k or whatever it was, because that's the way those events work. You know, the players are already there and they often will just hop into other tournaments. And I remember texting Eric just with complete dread um, in my heart saying, oh my God, Adrian Mateos is to my direct left. And for people who don't know, Adrian Mateos is not just one of the best tournament players, but one of the most aggressive. He's someone you do not want on your direct left, except Eric said something really, really good at that moment. He said, wonderful, learn from him, see yeah. what he's doing, pay really, really close attention, figure out 
what he does that makes it hard for you to play. What spots does he put you in? How does he do it? When does he do it? And that was such brilliant advice because it just completely changes your mindset from, oh shit, to, oh wow, what an amazing learning opportunity. Um, and it was. And, and from that point on, every time I play with the truly great players, that's what I do. Um, you know, I try to stay out of their way <laughs> and I try to observe what they do and how they do it and how they make me feel and see what I can take from that, what I can learn from it, how I can rise to a higher level by watching them and by trying to understand the mechanisms behind it. Because the other, I think the mistake that a lot of people make is to just blindly follow what the top players are doing without understanding why they're doing it. And so you end up doing it all wrong in all the wrong times. So, so yeah, that's- learning, <laughs> learning by road, poker is too complex to like learn by road. You can learn yep. like flop ranges, almost by rote, but even then, you know, you're in situations with different stack sizes and tournament payouts and stuff. Um, I mean, like, I think it's like easier than ever for like a generally smart person to become quite proficient at poker. The problem is I think the level that like the pro pros are at is like almost impossible to be, unless you're like dedicating your life to it, right? Cause I mean, part of the book is about like kind of honest like self-assessment right and I'm like okay I'm a pretty smart guy in ways that are poker relevant but there are also the people who are um who are equally if not more smart probably more smart and are devoting um every waking moment to getting better at poker whereas I'm kind of dabbling in this right it's kind of like I can't possibly be on that level although I don't know I mean you go to like a casino though I mean the online games are tricky you go to a casino and like um there's a lot of bad players out there, right? <laughs> but to like, you know, I don't know. I mean, how many, like, like what did you learn from, from other poker pros? Like Eric in some ways, Eric Seidel is one of the ultimate like survivors um, in the history of poker, right? One of the biggest winners in the history of poker, but also like relatively few people, maybe him and Daniel Negreanu, right? Are like kind of not too much drama, not too much controversy, just to have one consistently in different eras of poker and adapted to it. So what did you learn from Eric? What did you learn from other pros? Did kind of the nature of poker players surprise you at all? Well, the thing that I learned from Eric that's in the book, but which I just want to shout from rooftops for, for the rest of time, um, is this attitude that he has of less certainty, more inquiry. There's never one right way. Never be completely certain that you know how to play or what to do always be learning, always be growing, always be asking questions, always be seeing what else is out there. I think one of the reasons why Eric is still so good is not just because he plays and kind of is brilliant and, and studies, but because he's curious. And when he sees, you know, the 21 year olds coming up, he doesn't say, oh, those young guys don't know what they're doing. They haven't been there with me. They, he says, okay, what are they doing? <laughs> what tools are they using? How can I use them? You know, how can I learn them? What, what can I take from that? What, you know, what are, what are they doing that's new and interesting and exciting? Let me incorporate that. Because one of the, you know, one of the things that so many poker players do is they say, oh, this is how you play this hand. No, you, you never raise here. No, you never do. You always do this. You, you never do that. And, you know, Eric just taught me that whenever someone says, starts saying always or never or, or being absolute, you have to start questioning everything they're saying because that's not poker and there's never one way to play it a hand. And something that I found very frustrating, but I'm very glad um, in retrospect, is that he would never tell me how to play a hand ever. Whenever I asked him something, we'd kind of talk it through and think it through. And he always made it clear that he couldn't play a hand the way I can play a hand and vice versa, because we're different people. People perceive us differently. Our image is different. Everything about it is different. So it's not the same hand. Even if you take the exact same hand with every other player the same and you just swap me in for Eric or vice versa, the hand changes. Every single variable changes it and you have to constantly be thinking about that. Just one of the reasons why I find the game so interesting because you always have to be doing this sorts, this calculus. But there's a part of me that also, you know, sometimes just wants an answer. <laughs> 
why I think one thing people don't realize is like literally there are now programs called solvers that will give you the game theory optimal uh, strategy. And most of the time you're playing a mixed strategy, right? Some of the time you raise with this hand, some of the time you call with the same hand, right? So like literally um, there isn't a prescribed correct action, especially for all the harder decisions that poker players tend to agonize over. Um, but I want to get this other thing that kind of Eric is thinking at a little bit how the way he might play a hand or you might play a hand are different. I mean, um, one theme in the book is how men play poker against women. Um, can you talk about the different, uh, I was going to say pathologies, I guess that's the right word, but like the different kind of practices that men fall into when they play against yeah. women, if they're just women at the table. Um, and is that something which you can take advantage of? For sure. Um, so poker is on average between 96 and 98% male um, in, in terms of any given field. On the days when it's 96%, the tournament directors fist bump and say, yeah, there's so many women in the field today, um, which is kind of ludicrous, but that's that's the gender balance. Um, and you know, because of that, it's it's a world that's very male testosterone filled just by virtue of numbers. And a lot of the times men haven't played with a lot of women. So in their mind, they have kind of this image of how a girl plays poker. Um, and that image might come from their mom or their grandmother or their girlfriend <laughs> or Vanessa Selbst on TV, which is a very different. <laughs> so you have to, your, your goal, I mean, my goal as a player is to figure out how do they think women play? Because unless, you know, if you're talking about someone, you know, like Eric Seidel, people at the very top, of course, they look at other things. But the thing that everyone notices first about me is female. That's kind of, that stands out. And people have natural biases. I have natural biases. When I see certain types of players, I make certain assumptions that I shouldn't necessarily make. You know, I write in the book about how I completely misread this guy who, you know, had enormous biceps and, you know, tattoos down his arms and a shaved head. And I thought he was going to be this aggressive maniac. And so I ended up getting in a really bad situation and was then told that he was just one of the tightest players um, on the circuit which was a big oopsie on my part, but I definitely did the exact same thing that they, that men do to me, which is bias based on looks, based on what someone looks like as they sit down at the table. And at first it was a handicap because I was unsure of myself and didn't really feel, I, I just felt totally out of place. You know, it was kind of imposter syndrome on steroids. Because yeah, the biggest bluff that title kind of implies imposter syndrome right I know yeah. now that like you are very self-possessed about but like but yeah I mean is that is that how you felt for parts for of sure it? oh for sure I just felt like I should what am I doing here basically I don't know what I'm doing um I shouldn't be here and so I bled money like just at the beginning I just I couldn't win for the life of me because and this is after I had started winning online this is when I went to live poker because the dynamics were so different and people were so aggressive and people were bullying me and I would just try to avoid conflict and say, okay, you know, I don't need to win this pot. Here you go. You take it. <laughs> I just, and, and it, it's not a good way to play. It's that's, that's a losing strategy. No, it's, a, it's an awful feeling, right? And you, you know, I mean, every, every now and then be like, oh, I sat yeah. down at a table. It's like way harder than I expected. Right. Um, but you can't, I mean, if you don't have some aggression in poker, then. Absolutely. Right, so, so you can't be too safe in some ways. For sure, and and you start realizing that you know being tight and having this very passive strategy is actually very costly. It can be more costly than being aggressive because you just you lose chips and you lose chips and you lose chips and all of a sudden you look down and you've got no chips left. And how you know you didn't you didn't play any big hands, but it's also because then if you play a big hand, everyone knows you have a big hand. Yeah. <laughs> and so it becomes very transparent. And so, but when I started, when I realized this, then it actually became a huge advantage, I think, because one of the things that no matter how people see women, they tend to underestimate them. I'm talking in general, of course, there are some people who don't, but the general player pool in live poker, um, especially at the lower stakes, underestimates women a lot. And that is your superpower because if they don't think you're capable of something, then, then you can do it. So there are some people who just don't think women are capable of bluffing. 
you bluff them. There are some people who would rather die than be bluffed. Yeah. <laughs> by them. So they will call you down with anything. And so you never bluff them. But all of a sudden, I can value bet for thin value. I can value bet my bottom pair for three streets because I know I'll be called with ace high because just in case I'm bluffing, that guy will not fold. I know that there are the people who just will try to bully me out of pots and they'll relentlessly bet. And so I just wait until I have a decent hand and I hold on for dear life, even if it's bottom pair in that particular case. But others, they want to patronize me. If they bet big, they have a big hand and, you know, they'll call me honey usually and show me their cards and say, you know, here you go, honey, see, I had pocket aces. And I say, thank you so much. Um, so, so you have to figure it out and, and then you can play against it. It's always surprising how much information players are willing to give away for free, right? By showing you their hand after a bluff or after a big fold, right? Or, or if you correctly made a fold or incorrectly, right? But like, yeah. You're like, that's the currency in poker, right? You just give me free information, right? And you think you're going to yeah. tilt. Well, you can get tilted, but like, I mean, no. I mean, how much are you, I guess the kind of uncomfortable tension here is like, how much are you relying on, on your own stereotypes, right? That maybe a guy um, of a certain age, a little bit more girth, has a certain accent, refers to as honey. I mean, that probably starts to become a pretty reliable caricature, but then you can have this other case like you talked about where sometimes it can be misleading and people can intentionally kind of give you misinformation. Yeah. Um, I mean, how reliable are stereotypes based on someone's demeanor yeah. and demographic stuff? I mean, it gets kind of dicey here, right? It does get really dicey. And I think that um, as much as possible, you just shouldn't rely on them and you should realize you have them because if anyone is halfway decent, um, they're going to take advantage of it. You know, I have seen, you have no idea at this point, my stereotype of like the uh, older, nice old guy um, at the table has completely shifted where before I was like, oh, you know, very, very tight player, you know, older guy will only play good hands. Now I see them, I'm like, oh my God, you're going to be abusing that image <laughs> and, and raising with absolute crap and trying to bluff me. Um, and, you know, obviously that's not true either, but that's how often that stereotype is wrong. And so what I try to do, um, and I'd love to love to hear your take on this too, but I try as much as possible to not come to judgments until I, I have at least some sample size. Yeah. It's tough in live poker because you don't get the, the volume of hands that you get you know, in online poker. But I try to, even if someone, you know, three bets me three times in a row, I try not to say, okay, this person's an aggressive maniac. I try to think, okay, let me see a few more times. So how often are they three betting other people? You know, maybe they just have really good hands or maybe they're picking on me or, but there, there is a step before jumping to a conclusion when you try to just get more data that's actually behaviorally driven. How are they playing? Not how are they looking? It's so important to draw that line. That's what I didn't do with that, you know, with the big biceps guy. Had I just stopped and observed him for an hour, I would have realized that this was a really, really tight player, but I didn't. Um, and so I think that take your time and don't make assumptions right away and don't try to make exploits right away. You know, I would say at the beginning, I would just play kind of a fundamentally solid strategy. And then, you know, maybe further down when you become more certain, then you can start trying to work on those reads and those exploits. What yeah, do you think? Sometimes the exploits aren't always straightforward, right? Or sometimes you can like pick up a tell that someone's acting unusually, right? But like, it's actually a sign of strength and not weakness. You correctly detected something in their behavior, but you don't correlate it with actual hand strength. But yeah, look, I think like, um, I mean, it kind of comes up in like political analysis too, where if you run a big model of how does someone vote, um, you know, like racial and number of characteristics are like not as predictive as people assume. I mean, some are, but some aren't, right? And if you have behavioral information, like, okay, I know how you feel about um, abortion or climate change or whatever else, right? A little bit of behavioral information tells you a lot more than a lot of demographic information, right? So I think it's kind of the same at poker where like, I don't know. I mean, I think... Well, even as you were saying, this has become harder too. Telling someone is an amateur or a professional is probably A, doable and B, 
useful, right? But like the stuff like, oh, this guy is Swedish and the Swedes are really aggressive. I mean, you know, I mean, there's not a lot of value there, I don't think. Um, and I'm actually a dork, so I like to track stats for the table while I'm playing, um, including my own stats. You can see that like, I have very consistent preflop ranges by the same hands, right? Um, you'll see that you'll go whole hours being the loosest player at the table or the tightest player based entirely on on luck. And it takes quite a while for that to even out potentially. Um, I want to go to audience Q&A soon. So if you have a question, you can put it in the Q&A tab. Um, I want to give you one more of my questions first, which is, um, you know, I don't know if you want to advertise for poker, but if there are people out there who haven't played poker, what could the average person learn from playing more poker? I think that I do want to advocate for poker because I think the world would honestly be a much better place if more people were poker players in the sense of trying to approach the game seriously from a, a learning perspective, not, you know, let's sit down at the table and, oh, let's gamble, but actually learn about the game and about you know, how to make decisions in it the way that you'd approach learning chess. You know, no one sits down in front of a chess board unless you're in the middle of Washington Square Park and says, let's gamble. Um, so, so with that exception, you know, you, if you say, I want to learn chess, you try to learn strategy, you try to figure out kind of what, you know, how you think about it strategically, what the, what the game is about. If you approach poker the same way, I think that you will learn better decision-making skills on all levels, including something that is so incredibly hard for the human mind to learn, which is probabilistic thinking. Because poker, if you actually take the time to play, if you take the time to analyze, to analyze your hands, to analyze the different situations you're seeing, you start learning You know what 1% is, what 10% what <laughs> what is, what 25% is, you feel it viscerally. So when someone says 1%, you're like, holy shit, 1% is huge. You know, if I have a 1% edge, that's amazing. Yeah. If my hand is, you know, if my hand is a 98% favorite, that 2% feels like it happens a lot more often than 2%. <laughs> it seems like someone's always hitting that miracle card, but you start to feel it in a way that you don't in other walks of life. And when I was doing my graduate work, I was looking at decision-making under risky and uncertain conditions and kind of stock markets were, were how I chose to look at it back then because I didn't play poker, um, although poker would have been a great, great way to do it. And what you start seeing over and over is how bad people are at making these probabilistic judgments and yeah. <laughs> understanding this. They're, they're just awful, even if they're good at math, even if theoretically they're good at this kind of stuff. Practically speaking, there's this big divide and poker bridges it. And I think poker is also wonderful for emotional control, self-control, for mindfulness for learning to read yourself and read other people. Um, I, I can go on and on. I just think it gives so many great life skills, um, including making you more empathetic because you have to be more in tune with what other people are thinking in order to, in poker, take advantage of it. But in real life, it can just make you into a you know better listener, someone who is more attuned to what nonverbal cues people are sending. A lot of American presidents have been proficient poker players. So Obama, Nixon, uh, Eisenhower. Well, Nixon financed his campaign with poker winnings. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, and then some predecessor games of poker, probably the older, you know, Rushmore people, but like, but no, it is very unique. But I want to get to the audience uh, questions here. Um, okay, from, I don't know if I should name the person or not. Um, yeah. Okay, so Ben Ball asks, Eric gave you great advice about forgetting bad beats, um, but how do you deal uh, with folding the winning hand when you see somehow that you made a tight fold, somehow you see um, what a hand that the player holds or you were bluffed and the player decides to show you against my advice, but like, how do you deal with that? You know, you, you just smile and move on and you think, how often what you have to try to think about in poker is not any one hand but in general how often am i good here right how often is this a good fold and so i just try to remind myself that folding is often much harder than calling um i think 
a lot of us have more hero calls in us than we have hero folds. And so I never, you know, there's obviously this feeling of, damn, you know, if only I'd called, I'd have all these chips, but you just move on and you say, this is very valuable information because if I know I made a bad fold, that means that the other player just made a very bad mistake because they gave me this free information. They showed me these cards when they shouldn't have. Because one thing that Eric taught me that anyone who plays poker and is listening, don't ever show your, your cards unless you have to. Information is power <laughs> and you want as much of it and you wanna give off as little of it as possible. And so if I made a bad fold, I made a bad fold. Okay, what did I, what can I learn from that? You know, what, what did I do wrong? Why did I make this fold? Maybe it was even right. You know, maybe in this particular case, yes, I got bluffed, but in general, I should probably still be folding in spots like this. Just doing a post-game analysis every time something like that happens is really important just to try to check in and say, you know, did I make a good decision or not? If I didn't make a good decision, if I made the fold for the wrong reasons, because I was scared of, you know, this was, this was too big a call, or I had just lost a big pot, if it was for tilty reasons, for emotional reasons, or for the wrong read reasons. I made this fold, even though I'd normally call because I thought this was a really tight player based on two hands. Um, then I should be mad at myself, but not because of that hand, because I need to fix my decision process. That's the way that I would look at it. I think it's one of the things that would take like a more professional attitude to poker that I probably don't do enough as an amateur, right? Is really studying and really kind of reviewing, you know, not just kind of saying, oh, okay, well, that one hand sucked and you talk about your friend with it over a beer or something, but like actually being committed to like going through and, and self doing self critique. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question from a guy named Mitch. Why do you think uh, poker luminaries like Eric, Daniel, Phil Hamath from the early 2000s are not at the main event final tables anymore? <laughs> is that an aberration or do you think that some of these guys, I mean, part of it is because there are 8,000 entrants in the main event, right? Or 10,000 or whatever. So it's hard, but like, um, apart from Eric, um, which poker players kind of from that original generation did you really kind of, did you develop a respect for from studying poker more? Um, from, you know, from the original, from the original poker generation, you know, Dan Harrington is someone who I just admire to no end. And he made multiple final tables. Um, and uh, that was, that was a different era. I think he's he's kind of the the other person who who I got to know a little bit who I think is just absolutely tremendous. And then um, most of the people I worked with, I mean, I think Phil Galfond kind he's okay. much younger, obviously, but he's still kind of an elder statesman. Um, Patrick Antonius is someone who was very intimidating to me at the beginning. And he's so ridiculously nice um, and, and helpful and someone who's still is a mad, mad, mad crusher when it comes to tournament poker. I mean, I have learned so much playing with Patrick. Um, he just somehow, you know, we had a very funny experience where we both made um, day two of the main event at EPT Monte Carlo a few, a few years back. And I sat down and I think I was the chip leader of the table and he had um, probably one of the lowest chip stacks and within three hours, somehow, miraculously, he was the chip leader and there were no big pots. It was just meticulous aggression and very just strategic attacks that were brilliantly executed. Um, and, and you see that and you have to admire it. But I think that Nate, you did answer the question about why you know we don't see the same faces over and over at the main event final table. Well, it's hard, you've got, thousands and thousands and thousands of players. And there's a lot of variance. So what I always say, you know, is that in the long term, poker is a game of skill and variance evens out, but only in the long term. In the in any given tournament, you just you never know what's going to happen, especially if that tournament is the main event. Yeah, I forget how many times you have to double between the main event, like you basically have to win 13 coin flips in a row, right? Or something like that, right? And even if you're a really good player, let's say you're a magic coin flipper who can win 60% of your coin tosses, you're still going to lose 4% of the time and eventually they'll cut up, catch up to you except the one in, you know, 1,000 times it doesn't, but it's quite, it's quite hard and it's quite humbling, I think. 
Um, question from Dean. Um, do you begin each tournament with a global strategy or are there too many variables to consider given each table's composition? So kind of a related question to that is when you go and, and sit down, um, are you saying, here are my goals for day one of the tournament, day two of the tournament, day three of the tournament as you go further? Um, or do you think it's kind of silly because until you get in certain situations, all poker is kind of the same? <laughs> well, I mean, I think that I do have different strategic outlooks for different stages of a tournament. So, and for different stages of being at a table. Um, so, you know, I've, I've heard this advice from, from multiple professional players that oftentimes, you know, when they're playing kind of one of these large field events for the first hour or so at a new table, they won't play very many hands at all because that's your time for observation. You basically don't want to get a lot of good hands early on because you want to see what other people are doing and how they're playing and how they're adjusting poorly. And you yourself, um, at least I always just start with like very fundamentally solid, not nothing too out of line. Now that I say this, you know, if I go through a list of people who are who are watching and I see you at the table, I'll probably do something totally different. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's also the thing about poker. You have to constantly adjust your strategy based on what others think of you. I had to change how I played um, after I became better known. And there was a very, very funny moment where I realized that I what worked before wasn't going to work anymore. Um, it was at a World Poker Tour event in Montreal, and I was playing with Joseph Chong, who's a great tournament player, um, made the final table of the main event a number of years ago. Um, you know, someone who's very good at what he does. Um, and he just owned my soul. And at some point I was like, what is going on here? I know he's very good. And then he said, oh, you know, great. Um, you played really, he's a great, great footage from the PCA or from EPT Barcelona, oh, I don't no. remember. But I was on a televised table for multiple days during a, an event and he, this footage had just been released and he watched all of it. And so he knew that I basically had to call down very light with very weak cards because people were bullying me a lot at that time and that I had adjusted my play accordingly and that I was and he realized that and so he would just he he attacked me relentlessly that way and he was right um and that was kind of my aha moment when I thought oh wow I have to readjust you know my strategy no longer works because the good players who've seen it and who've studied it now know to take advantage of it so would you rather be unknown or known then? Um, you know, it's a mixed bag. I think for, in terms of my bottom line, I'd probably better be unknown um, because nobody knows who in the world you are. There's no footage of you. They can't do any research on you. On the other hand, um, I stopped getting a lot of the crap that I got at the tables earlier when, when people actually knew who I was. Um, so a lot of the sexism, a lot of the harassment went away. Um, because I was someone that they couldn't get away with harassing anymore, um, which is horrible, right? That's, that's, it's so awful that it took being recognized for that to happen. Um, it should just be normal. But unfortunately, um, that's not the world we live in. I mean, I guess we we're kind of dancing around this before. Why, why do you think the poker world is 96% or 7% male or whatever it is, right? Because in other ways, Poker is a pretty diverse environment. It's ethnically and racially quite diverse. It's very diverse age-wise. It's kind of diverse class-wise to get to the higher stakes, right? Um, but it's like 97% men, um, even though the women players that are out there are often very, very good. Do um, you think it's cultural? Do you think it's because men are unpleasant to deal with? Do you think it's, you know, they like games more? I don't know. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a lot of things. Um, I do think culturally there's an element of that because, you know, historically it's been male and the popular depiction of poker oftentimes um, is not something that is particularly appealing to women. Um, but and the other thing is reality and not cultural. It's the fact that at the lowest levels, and what I mean lowest levels, I just mean stakes. You know, when you walk into your local casino and try to sit down at the one-two game, you're going to enter into an environment 
where there are a lot of people who are not going to treat you well and who are going to harass you and not think twice about it because that's how they've always behaved and they don't think it's a big deal and they're there to have fun. They're there to drink um, and they're there, you know, to proposition you <laughs> and to, you know, relentlessly flirt, even if your, you know, your body language and everything else about you says stop <laughs> and, and don't do that. Um, and you're going to, you're going to encounter that. And I encountered that a lot at the lowest levels. And there was, there were a few moments where I thought, you know what, if I weren't a journalist, if I weren't doing this for a book, if I didn't know exactly what to expect, the fact that poker can be this amazing, welcoming world with all of these brilliant minds, if I thought this is it, just get up and walk away. Yeah. And so, so I do think that there needs to be really fundamental changes at the top I'm talking about management, about floor staff, about, you know, the whole culture, because I think I get harassment as a female player. Think about the dealers. The dealers just have to deal with all of this crap all the time. And it's unfair. Um, I have now come to a point where I will just, I, I have zero tolerance. So I've called out players. I've I call the floor, but it took me a while to get to a place where I was comfortable doing that. I think if more men actually did that and actually spoke up and actually changed the norms of behavior, um, then more women would come to the game because I think women are so good at poker um, and can be brilliant players. And I think that it can help you grow. Um, I think poker made me into a much stronger version of myself. Um, than the pre-poker Maria. You know, I'm, I'm someone who I think found a lot more of my self-assertiveness. Um, as my husband put it at some point um, when, when we were, when he heard me talking, he said, you know, you take a lot less shit from people than you used to. And I think that that's a great <laughs> thing. life skill for sure. No, but it is true because I was going to ask a question, you know, earlier about, oh, how, you know, all these various couple clubs are very generous with their time and sometimes their money I found the same thing right but like I'm thinking back to last time I played like a one three game or something right and like it's not the most pleasant cast of characters <laughs> very often um we have like two more minutes I'm gonna ask you one last question from Elizabeth um do you think there'd be any value in looking at book from a neuroscience perspective um do you have hypotheses about why different players play differently and kind of what what motivates them such a great question. I do think that poker is just ripe for study from the psychological standpoint. So not necessarily just neuroscience, but social and cognitive psychology. I mean, I think that this is, there's, there needs to be more dialogue between the poker world and the academic world, because it is such just a beautiful gift to studying human behavior and decision-making and emotions and all of these things. Um, would I expect to see differences if we, you know, put different types of players in scanners, um, kind of looked at how they made decisions? Absolutely. I would think that, you know, you would have less emotional involvement. Um, you'd have kind of more of the prefrontal cortex if we're getting um, more, you know, more neuroscientific, um, more of those networks um, working in in players, even when they're in highly emotional situations, whereas we'd get kind of more of the normal amygdala responses from, from people who were more amateurish. Um, but I think that we do, one of the other things that I think poker would be interesting to study um, is the role of hormones. Um, because we do know that with risk-taking behavior and decision-making, testosterone plays a big role. Um, and so there have been really cool studies with traders um, and showing what kinds of decisions they make when they're more aggressive, um, you know, more risk-seeking, more risk-averse, and the cortisol and testosterone levels at various points um, of time. And so I think that doing something like that uh, with poker would also give you a lot of insight. And it's also one of the reasons why I think that women can make much better poker players because we don't have those same testosterone spikes. I mean, even stuff like I have a notorious streak of like always uh, like busting out like the last time before the dinner break, right? Cause you're hungry, you're not thinking very well. Um, anyway, we are a little bit over time now. Um, so I'm gonna let you go, Maria, um, but please uh, support Greenlight Bookstore, uh, buy the biggest bluff if you haven't yet. Um, look forward to Maria's future project and I'll see you out in Vegas pretty soon, I guess. 
I'll see you soon, Nate. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, it's been such a pleasure. And everyone, The Signal and the Noise is an absolutely brilliant book. So if you haven't read it, you should buy that as well. You know, support Greenlight, buy lots of books. And Nate is also working on a new book and I can't wait to read that when it comes out next year. Hopefully next year. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I'll get serious about it. this trip to Vegas is related to kind of the kickoff of the book basically. So yeah. Excellent. Okay. Thanks again, everybody. Have a great night and we'll talk to you soon. Yeah, thank you so much, Nate and Maria, for a wonderful conversation. Um, you can buy books by both authors from Greenlight. Uh, stop by if you're in Brooklyn. Uh, in person, we're open for limited browsing, noon to 7 p.m. every day of the week. Or you can find the buy link to The Biggest Bluff in the chat, um, and you can shop online at greenlightbookstore.com for a super quick local pickup or for shipping anywhere in the US. Thanks so much again, everyone, and have a wonderful evening. Good night. Good night.